Welcome into another edition of Talking Ducks. Oregon gets the big time road shutout against Purdue. What kind of trap game was that? We'll break that down and then also take a look ahead at a top 20 matchup at home against Illinois that nobody had on paper when the season started, but thus is the way of the Big Ten. And speaking of the Big Ten, Dan Rubenstein is going to join us for a couple of segments and let us know, does Oregon deserve this number one ranking? How long can they hold on to it for? And really the current state of the Big Ten and what that means for Oregon along the way. But let's bring in the rest of the panelists. We've got Aaron Fentress, Anthony Newman, and no Joey Harrington this week, but we wish him happy birthday, whatever he might be doing right now to celebrate that. So guys, we get a little bit more airspace here this week, and I clearly still don't have my voice after working with Oregon men's and women's basketball this past weekend. But Aaron, let's start with you. Many people thought this was a trap game against Purdue. Quick week. Oregon was crowned as one of the best teams in the college football world. The greatest game ever at Autzen Stadium they're coming off of. And now you're going against a, a Purdue team that scored nearly 50 points against Illinois. They go on the road and deliver a road shutout, a rarity for the Oregon Ducks. They get the 35 to nothing victory. What would you make of this performance and how Oregon kind of overcame the mental roadblock of a possible trap game? Oh, my stars. Wow. You did everything you could to try and make that something impressive. They were favored by 28. Purdue isn't any good. Maybe I just give the Ducks more credit than most people, and I didn't believe for a second that was a trap game. I thought they'd go in, they'd stomp them early and cruise to a victory. I did think they'd score another touchdown or two. I did think they probably would give up more than they gave up, which was zero, but I never at any moment in time during the week or during the game believed it was a trap game. You give them credit for going, you can't do better on defense than zero, right? So you give them an A plus for that. Offensively, you can find some things in nitpick, but again, they're not being challenged. So you're not gonna go all out and try and score 60. You're gonna, like I said, get in, stomp them early, make them basically quit, and then kind of cruise to the win because 35-0 is not much different than 60-0 in this type of game. So props to Oregon all the way around. They took care of business. They didn't have a hangover from what was a huge win, win against Ohio State. But if you're really a national title contender, this shouldn't even be a thing. No one should even be talking about trap games. So props to them for taking care of it and uh, destroying Purdue right away. All right, Anthony, your take from this one. Yeah, you, you know... You agree? Pe pe no, well, I agree. Uh, uh, you know, th there's th this team, Purdue. Uh, they're not a very good football team. Let's be real. Uh, let let's understand that. Uh, you still got to think about. Okay, it was a short week. You come off of Ohio, Ohio State, uh, and you know, guys, are they healthy? Are, are they feeling good? That's up to the coaching staff to get this team ready. And he got the team ready. And yes. Oregon did what they needed to do against Purdue. Now, when you talk about defense shutting somebody out, it is hard in today's game to shut somebody out. I don't care who you're playing against. This game is made for the offense to win. Okay, They're, they want people to come watch some, way up high. The people up, up top who are calling the shots, they want people to watch games, come to football games, because it's going to be 50 to 49. Not in this game. Okay, Oregon shut them out. And so talk about a defense that's that put it together against a you know a D1 football team in the conference, a conference play opponent. That was outstanding for me. It really was. And Aaron, this is what my takeaway was. It wasn't so much I doubted that Oregon was going to beat Purdue. It's just what kind of response would Oregon have after this Ohio State game? Because we've seen years before, right, where Oregon has a big win and then it's a random game on the road against an Arizona or Stanford comes into town, which are obviously a little bit better opponents than Purdue. But to me, it felt like it showed a mental sharpness to this team that has really spoke volumes to the way that this team has improved from week one to now. And you're supposed to beat Purdue 35-0. I get that. The fact that they did that, and there really wasn't a let-up in the score that this game was really never even a contest at any moment, to me shows the mentality of this team is in par with the performance on the field, that this team is locked in. And I think that's what is really important thing for Oregon is, are you locked in at this point in the season? Are you showing signs of improving where some of the top teams have started to show cracks here or there, or they've stumbled? That was what I really pulled away from this one, less than the score of this game. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you, you got a comment on that, Aaron? No, you that they're okay. not okay? No, you're, you're Crack out your tongue for the first time in your life? <laughs> No, you're you're 100% correct in that 
then at least they say that. Cost me my flowers. They for didn't once. blow it, but the chances <laughs> of them. It's like Jordan. If you went down to the local middle school and challenged guys to one on one, and you're winning every game 11 0, I'm not gonna be like, oh, Jordan, you're amazing that you showed the intestinal for it. Hey, like, I would, but I, you I would say at least he's not tearing his Achilles at 40. He's doing dominate. what he's supposed to be doing. I'm just, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Anthony, okay. I love it. I, either way. To me, what stood out is that it was a business trip on a short week yes. after the biggest win ever at Autzen Stadium. And I think that speaks volumes that they performed that way on the road. And so Against we'll talk one more and five about this team. game when we come back. A lot more to break down the offensive performance, the defensive performance with the shutout. But the Ducks seem to be rolling. And oh, by the way, they're the number one team in the nation at this point. So holler. Stick around. We'll be right back on Talking Ducks. Welcome back into Talking Ducks. The defensive performance for Oregon on the road against Purdue. Anthony, it was the first shutout since 2012. The first road shutout since 1992. I think oh. you were... Still in the league at that time, or I don't know what you were doing. Yeah, but I'm in the league, yeah. A long time yeah. ago. I mean, yeah. you're, you're talking 30-plus years that the defense has shut out a team on the road, and this wasn't Sisters of the Poor. This is Purdue, a legitimate Big Ten team. What did you take away from this defense? Because everyone says defense travels. Well, they certainly did and brought some baggage with them as well. Well, that was an outstanding performance by the defense. Without Jordan Birch their so-called best player. Uh, the two young defensive edge rushers, they're only true sophomores. Mateo and Tatum are unreal. These two guys, are they're going to be a nightmare to deal with. And then there's another young linebacker. Devin Jackson is a baller. I mean, he's flying sideline to sideline at 235 pounds at 6'2". So the defense is very fast. They had t uh, 10 TFLs, tackle for loss. That's unbelievable. You're playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. And then the secondary, that, the, the secondary has been locked down all year. So you have the front end playing with the back end. Uh, it was a great performance. And Aaron, I mean, again, this defense, no Birch. We were wondering who are going to be some of the playmakers. And you've always talked about if Oregon's going to do great things during the season or if a team is going to be great, you got to be able to get after the quarterback. You got to have pass rushers. A terrific sign that you're starting to see some youth especially develop at that position. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's huge because you're going to face, obviously, good passing attacks as you move along in the playoffs, which Oregon is going to be in. And it was a dominant performance. And as I said, you can't do better than zero, right? But this is a mediocre Purdue offense. That, let me say they scored seven against Notre Dame. They scored 10 against Nebraska. They scored six against Wisconsin. So they're not good. So you go in there. And you dominate them, which is what they did, which is why it, the game became an easy cruise game because the offense didn't have to worry about scoring and you can get in and get out healthy, right? My only concern, though, because you had in the rundown, Aaron, are you finally impressed, is that the two best teams they played put up some numbers on them and, and scored some points. So, yes, very good defense, has taken care of business against bad teams, against good teams. They've shown some, you know, soft spots here and there that could come back to bite them in the end. But for this game, yes, definitely a dominant performance. Well, to follow up on that, Aaron, the two games I think you're referencing, Boise State, Ohio State, right? Which, again, talented teams. One of those teams has the Heisman Trophy favorite in Genty. Nobody's really been able to slow him down. And then Ohio State, what did you see in those two games about this defense? Where were the cracks or the question marks on this unit against those two squads? Well, against um, Boise, obviously, it was stopping big running plays, which they held Genty to a lot of short runs, but he also broke off some big ones. And they gave up touchdowns late, like the fourth quarter touchdown when the game was on the line. Same thing against Ohio State. Now, these are obviously a great running back and a great rushing attack and one of the best offenses in the country in Ohio State, right? So there's really no shame in that. But those are the two games I focus on, not the other ones against mediocre to bad teams, because those are the types of teams you're going to face in the big 10 championship in the playoffs three or four times, right? And so things aren't going to always bounce your way. And those two games were won at home. Do they lose those two games on the road? You know, if they don't have that advantage, I don't know. And so I'm pointing to the defense because if you're going to lose a game 40 to 37, that's going to be on the defense. And right now, those two games were primarily won by the offense. And Ohio State 
you know, if not for the offensive PI, Ohio State moved right into field goal position, position, and we're probably going to maybe win the game. So that's the only thing I'm saying. Against elite competition, I have reservations about the defense at this point. Aaron, Aaron, I have a question for you. Has the defense gotten better? If you say so, yes. What? Over, when, over <laughs> what? <though>? Over what? <laughs> I'm asking you, seriously, because that's what you, you know, you want to do every game. You want to get better. You, you, you start the year. Yeah. You, you know, you have some, some slow games and then you improve. The ceiling's very high. They have a lot of talent. Okay. But sometimes you don't get better as a defense. Have they gotten, have they gotten better since, since the first game? No. They haven't. Have they? Maybe you how guys are, they, are watching how are they teams. Be, are <laughs> they, I mean, competition, competition matters. I just read off the scores for Purdue. And again, I'm not, I'm give, I give Oregon's defense an A. But what I'm saying is, and you know it's true, what matters is how you look against the best teams. I'm not saying they need to shut down the best teams, but they gave up 30 plus, and that means your offense has to score 40 or so to win those games. And if you have to score 40 to beat elite teams, then your defense is not necessarily great. That's all I'm saying. So those are my reservations moving forward, and we'll see if come Big Ten championship game or come playoffs, the defense can rise up and take a good offense and hold it into the low 20s or below. That's all I'm saying. Oregon's ranked 15th in the nation right now in total defense, just by the way. They have right. moved up the rankings. And they play by the way, the they worst. have gotten better, by the way. And they've played some of the a worst offenses in the country. Too. Now, Anthony, I want to give you a chance to talk about this Oregon offense here because Dylan Gabriel, another stellar performance, 80-plus percent completion percentage. We've seen him do that a handful of times this year. What do, you, what do you take away from his play thus far? Because he's now third in the Heisman Trophy rankings. You go Ashton Genty, you go Cam Ward in Miami, and then as Dylan Gabriel, I mean, he just continues to be consistent offensively. We've seen the issues with the picks here and there, but what Oregon's needing to pair with this defense, you probably couldn't ask for more from the quarterback position. He is a dangerous dude. Uh, being a defensive coordinator, trying to defend him, that's a problem. He touches the ball every offensive snap, and that's, that's a problem because he can do a lot of things with I don't know, what, what was he, 21 of 24 or 22 or 25 uh, in this last game? Uh, two Something touchdowns? I'm sure Aaron wish he would have gotten on a math test growing up. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, this kid is unreal. He can hurt you with his arm. He can hurt you with his leg. Okay, he has a lot of experience. He's been all over the place. Okay, he understands the game. He understands the defense. And he, and he also understands his offense, his supporting cast around him. He's making everyone better. He's a nightmare, and he's getting better. He's improving as the games go on. Uh, I wouldn't want to face him. Honestly, seriously, he's he's the tough one to deal with. One quick thought on Gabriel here, Aaron. You're just now that you've seen him kind of get through halfway of the season. Uh, he's been great. He was great in the game that mattered the most, and that's the most important thing as far as the Heisman go. I, I think he needs a few more bigger performances because Cam Ward putting up ridiculous numbers because his defense sucks and he has to carry them. And then Genty, Genty to me, I'm not, I'm not, I don't give any kind of national player of the year credence to anyone from Gonzaga basketball or Boise football. You don't play a real schedule. I'm not impressed. So right now, Travis Hunter has to be in the mix, Ward and Gabriel for me. And by the way, I have a Heisman vote. Hunter's so. been banged up. You mentioned Genty in the schedule. And then Cam Ward, that Miami team, has got some holes as well, too. So really? it's probably really? wide open like this national well, championship it, race. Yeah. I was just going to say, if Dylan had, the, had Miami's defense, Dylan would have bigger numbers and probably be the clear front runner by now. So that's, that's a detriment to him is that the defense is just shutting teams out, down at least. All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about Oregon being this number one ranked team in the nation at the moment, what that means after Oregon surpasses Georgia in the polls. We'll let you know when we come back on Talking Ducks. You guys were ranked number one in the AP and the coaches' polls. What does it mean for you as a leader of this program to bring it back to number one for the first time since 2012? Who cares? Welcome back to Talking Ducks. Well, guess what? After Georgia took care of business against Texas on the road, they're left one team near the top undefeated, and that would be your 7-0 Oregon Ducks, ranked number one for the first time since 2012. Now, keep in mind, 
When they were ranked number one back then, they held it for one week before losing at home to number 14 Stanford in heartbreaking fashion. Still can't believe they lost that game. Another time they've held the number one ranking, 2010 for six weeks. And so Aaron, being number one, everyone talks about that. Anytime you see a new team that's not Georgia, Ohio State, or Alabama, or Clemson in the last 12 years, kind of a big deal for the most part. What do you make about Oregon ascending to the top of the rankings and just what that means for this program at the moment? Oh, it's huge. I mean, you're ranked number one in the country. So I mean, you can't get ranked higher than that. Now, clearly finishing number one is more important, which Oregon has never done. But being ranked number one at this point, especially when you came you came in three, right? So there were high hopes. And then you fell all the way to nine and climbed your way back up to number one. It, it's huge. It's impressive. And it should be celebrated, no doubt. Yeah, and Anthony, I think you have the big win against Ohio State. And that's why the follow-up in dominant fashion, I think, Against Purdue, I think a lot of people just see that 35-0. And I think also the fact that all the other teams around Oregon have lost a game at some point this year. While Oregon hasn't looked flawless in all their games, they're the only team that's passed some of the biggest tests this season. If you look at Boise State, Ohio State, and that right there probably means a tremendous amount for Oregon to now be number one and have a chance to hold it for a couple of weeks. You know, Duck fans, uh, uh, alums, we're, we're all happy for Oregon being number one. It's, it's a great thing. Uh, but, you know, Aaron, you can do your homework on this. Uh, on week eight, you know, and you go back in history, the teams that were ranked number one at this time, did they win a national champion championship? I, I don't know. I, I mean, it, 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 it's, hard to, it's hard to go undefeated. <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, at the same time, I think this coaching staff – they're going to do a great job of telling this team it's not about the, the rankings right now. It's about us. It's about what we do. Uh, and our next opponent is Illinois, and we got to take care of them. Uh, we have to play the way we know how to play. And that's what's more important than the rankings. Yes, the rankings are going to help them, you know, get number one seed, all that stuff. But it's just, it's just about, hey, who's who are we playing, okay, and who do we have to defeat uh, the next game, the next game, till you get to the national championship game. And then at the end of the year, when you're ranked number one because you won it, that's when it counts. I have a question too, Aaron. You're number one in the nation now, and you're still in the middle of all your recruiting at this point, and kids are trying to decide what school to go to. It seems like it just hits a little bit harder when the number one team in the nation is after you, regardless of where you're at in the country. And if Oregon can hold this for a couple of weeks now, as these high school seasons are starting to wrap up in mid-November, I mean, I think to me, you try to milk this as much as you can. Uh, you try to hawk two of this thing, honestly, for the next six, eight weeks for the most part. Don't you, you think this is number one ranking? You try to what? You know, I don't think you get the reference here. My no, man. I'm afraid I do. That's why I'm scared. Uh, <laughs> no, I, look, I, okay. You beat Ohio State in a great football game, right? Which, you know, when you win a close game like that, you show a certain type of resolve and toughness. And it's Ohio State. And, and the, their respect across the nation is clear, right? You have respect as well as Oregon because you've accomplished a lot of great things. But Oregon has not won a national title. That's the one thing they're chasing. But right now, you're ranked number one after beating Ohio State a couple of weeks ago. You can take that number one ranking. You can send it out to recruits, to recruits and say, hey, we're number one. The nation, our co the coaches across the nation and the AP voters across the nation, except for a couple, <laughs> have us ranked number one. And you had, what, 100 recruits at that game? Right? I, I mean, that. yeah, you, you can't buy that type of recognition, really, other than winning a national title. So, yeah, they, they should strike while the iron's hot. I think they're going to hold on to it. I don't think there's much another team can do to really take it from them. Now, I do. there's two voters who voted for Georgia. Um, you can kind of see the argument there because Georgia beat number one Texas on the road. They also took out Clemson, which is ranked number nine, by much bigger scores, whereas Oregon eked out a win by one at home against Ohio State. But Georgia did lose, did lose to Bama, sorry. But is that loss to Bama stronger than wins like Purdue and UCLA, et cetera, et cetera? So you can make that argument, but no doubt right now, Oregon deserves to be number one. You hang on to number one as long as you can. No team has held on to the number one ranking for more than three weeks this season so far. All right, when we come back, Dan Rubenstein from the Solid Verbal Podcast. He'll join us for a couple segments. Talk to us about this win against Purdue, his thoughts on the ever-evolving landscape of the Big Ten. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Talking Ducks. We now have our good friend Dan Rubenstein from the Solid Verbal Podcast joining us. And Dan, you get the whole crew with you since Joey's not here, so we get a chance to riff off of things. But I, I want to start with you. Just your thoughts on Oregon's performance against Purdue. A lot of people would have circled this game as one of those hangover games. It's a quick week. You were just crowned one of the greatest teams in the country that upset over Ohio State. And this might have been the most impressive performance for Oregon following a big game as far as taking care of their business on the road. But I'm curious, what did you take away from this as far as what Oregon did on the road in that short week? Yeah, for a lot of teams, this is what's considered to be, even in the NBA, like a scheduled loss, right? That you are going out the night before in Miami and then playing the Heat at like 1 p.m. You're like, well, that's going to be a loss. And for lesser teams, this situation is kind of a scheduled loss. And it has been for previous years, Oregon teams. And for them to come out, and I thought they were fine. I thought it was a B-plus type game. But if your B-plus game is winning 35 nothing and finding Evan Stewart deep pretty immediately and getting off the field on third down and completely silencing a passing attack that kind of went off the week before against a ranked Illinois team in that second half, Oregon's in a great place to, to be sort of, at the moment, trap-proof, which that's like... 127 teams can't say that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and Aaron, it's interesting because we've seen this so many times with Oregon back in the Pac-12 where they have that matchup against a Stanford or against an Arizona State, and maybe that type of game is looming here soon. But for as high as the Ducks were after that victory against Ohio State to turn around, and as Dan pointed out, it wasn't an A-plus game by any means, but the way you just dominate that game against a Purdue team that put up a lot of points against Illinois, to me, it, it showed a lot of resolve about where this team is mentally at this point in the season, Aaron. Why do you always set me up to be the bad guy? No, I don't buy any of that. I know, I know, I got you, it's my job. But here's the thing, my, my stance on this is actually pro-Oregon, because I didn't buy for a second that this was a trap game. They have no defense. They have a weak offense. Yes, they scored a bunch of points against Illinois, but look at their other games. I fully expected Oregon to go in there and stomp them, and they did it in a, in a gentlemanly way, right? They got out to a big lead early, and then just kind of cruised to a victory. If they'd wanted to, no, they could have dropped didn't. 60, but they didn't. But they did. It wasn't a trap game. They were favored by 28. A trap game is something where, like, the team is competitive. You should beat them. There was a 28-point spread. Had they lost that game, that would have been one of the biggest, most disappointing losses in in program history. But so, it didn't yes, happen. They, I know, exactly. They took care of business as I thought they would. I give them more credit than everyone out there saying it was a trap game. Come on, Purdue, really? Nah. How many, but how many points was Alabama favored by against Vanderbilt after beating Georgia, right? Vanderbilt's fine. Vanderbilt's better than Purdue, of course. I'm not but saying. But this is college football. True. I'm not saying trap games don't happen. I'm just saying I, for, for me, I gave yeah. Purdue no chance to make this a trap game. That's oh, yeah. All. That's, That's all. fair. That's all. But it's still the sport. It's still college football. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, Anthony, you saw what Purdue was able to do against Illinois. Illinois, ranked team with a pretty solid defense that has played some teams pretty tough this year. I looked at the 28-point spread and thought that was fascinating. I know we talked about this earlier about how Oregon did come in there. But really, Anthony, I'm more so concerned about the mentality of this team. I think that's what this spoke volumes about is that you go and shut a team out. First road shutout since I think 1992 for Oregon. Just one of the better defensive performances we've ever seen on the road, clearly. Well, first of all, Aaron, I, no, I, I think you talked about a trap game. You talked about all that no, stuff. No, I didn't. In the last, I said show. last you week. Did. I said last week the same thing I just said. Okay, go no, ahead. No, you, you. I know you did. No, okay. I didn't. But but here's what I here's what I was saying all along. Okay, it's real simple. We're talking about the point spread. We're talking about schemes. We're talking about all this, the mental part of the game. It's real simple. Oregon has more dudes. And you win with football games with dudes on the field. It's not about coaches. It's not about anything else. My receiver is faster than your corner. and He's going to run right past you. My linebackers will get off the blocks and make tackles. It's that simple. And Oregon came into this game... Yes, with they, they just won a big Ohio State. That, that was a big game. Big all, okay, now can you do it again? Uh, you know, yes, they're gonna do it again because they got more dudes. Exactly. There's no question. Which is, which is why it wasn't a trap to me. Yeah. Well, well, let's get to this fact here. And Dan, Oregon's the number one team in the nation. I think we saw that coming after Georgia took care of business against Texas. And 
for me, it's crazy because you look at how dominant Georgia has been the last couple of years and then Alabama and what Ohio State has been able to show. For the Ducks to be ranked, there's just something that has a little bit extra sparkle with that number one ranking. Just, just your thoughts on Oregon getting to the top. I know there's a lot of football left this season, but sure, the fact that they climbed to the top of the mountain after this start of the season they had against Idaho, it, pretty remarkable this year. Yeah, I think it speaks to the improvement in their ability to adjust, obviously, with how beat up and uncertain things seem to look on the offensive line, the way they started out against Idaho and Boise State, slowly coming together, making the move to have Poncho at center, and things seem to come together a little bit more, took care of business against UCLA. Obviously, the Michigan State turnovers in the red zone were a hiccup, but when you're making mistakes like that and you still win by three touchdowns and you're shutting them out when it's not garbage time... They're one of those, they're a team, I don't know how many teams in the country can say this, that there's no pronounced weakness to this Oregon team. There are things they can improve upon, but there's no leaky secondary. There's no offensive line issues. There's not a lack of playmakers on offense. That Oregon has, to me, more ways to win than they've ever been able to point to. And when you look at where Texas is, and they were sort of untested heading into Georgia, you look at some of those games, you know, Georgia's first quarter against Alabama, the struggle against Kentucky, who's a very mediocre team this season, that Oregon had a letdown against Boise State against the best running back in the sport and maybe the G5 representative in the college football playoff and have improved every game since. So I didn't know if Oregon was going to belong on the same field as Ohio State. And now I don't, I'm not positive that Ohio State belongs on the same field as maybe Georgia, maybe one of those teams. But to come out of that game and say, wow, Ohio State couldn't change anything on their defensive front against Oregon. Wow, Ohio State wasn't ready for a last second drive. I'm used to saying that about Oregon in previous years. And now those questions exist a little bit louder for other teams. Okay, wait, you said ever? When, when is the, who is the more complete Oregon team than this year's team thus far? In history? In the last 20 years. I mean, the team that went undefeated, the team that went to the, the two teams that went to the national championship game, maybe even the 2012 team. I, 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 the 2012 I push team. Back, I push back against historical comparisons until a team actually does something. Winning by one what? point over Ohio State is the only thing this Oregon team has really done. So it's difficult so they, how, for me to Which say one of those teams beat a top two, three, four opponent in the country? They blew out Florida State in 2014, the defending national champions on a 24-game winning streak with the number one pick in the draft and a, and a Heisman Trophy winner. They blew them, what was it, 58 to 21 or something? They beat that team. That team wasn't number two in the country. That was a flawed team that was not blowing teams they out all the year. They were winning last-second games, right? That defending, Florida State team? Defending national champs, I mean. They were the defending national champs, but it's a different team, a different year, a different team. Look, Florida State was on the verge of the playoff this year, right? Or last year. How are they this year? Different year, different team. They were in the playoffs that year. I'm not talking about a bum team. They hadn't lost in sure. 25 games. So you're but saying Florida the winner State of Ohio was, State was bigger than that game. I'm saying right now Oregon is deeper and looking more complete than they have in previous seasons. Now, okay. you can point to 2012. 2012 team was probably the best overall season that Oregon has had. But really, this year's team, in terms of defensive talent, in terms of defensive depth, I don't know. I think their, their ceiling is higher. This was still a, a 2012 team with... Good talent on offense, a great Heisman winning quarterback. I think there's just more on this team thus far because of that Ohio State win. Okay, we'll see how it well, well, plays out. Stick but don't forget, for one more wait, wait, segment here, Buckner, Aaron. I know you got to get no, to this Buckner point. Buckner and Armstead <laughs> were first round picks. Just remember, and Efa would have been a first round pick. Yep. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Aaron, are you done? I'm done. Are you done? Can we, can we get to commercial here? I'll call you All later, right, Dan. When we come we'll back, we're going to go around the Big Ten. We'll talk some more about Oregon's number one ranking. I'll let you guys chat offline about it. <laughs> but we do have to talk about USC, the rest of the Big Ten. How are things looking? Can Oregon remain in the number one spot? Remember, last time they were number one, they lost the very next week after that. We'll let you know when we come back on Talking Ducks. Welcome back to Talking Ducks. My voice is still gone, and Dan and Aaron are still arguing. But <laughs> we're going to get to around the Big Ten here because, Dan, we're learning a lot of things about this conference that many people didn't have penciled in when the season started. If you would have told me that Indiana and Illinois would have been ranked higher than Michigan, I would have called you crazy. But at this point, the Hoosiers are legit. Illinois has been looking really good. Michigan can't find a quarterback to save their life. What do you make about the big picture of this Big Ten where really Oregon's the only team out West that has a say in possibly playing in the conference title game? Yeah, it's 
it's not a terrible surprise that the LA schools have struggled in that they just haven't found bodies on the offensive and defensive lines these past couple years. USC is looking to the portal, and it just you just can't do everything in the portal. Obviously, Oregon has succeeded there, but they've also built it up in the high school ranks. Washington, we knew was going to be a full rebuild, but all things considered, other than some late game play calling and decisions. It's a solid Washington team. It's not a great Washington team. They're solid. What Indiana's done has been incredible. I think Kurt Signetti's done a great job, obviously bringing in the players he did from James Madison with him has been great. But honestly, there is a, a pretty steep fall off after Oregon, Ohio State, and Penn State in this conference. And it's just that everybody seems to be beyond there, either deeply flawed on one side of the ball or winning close games against inferior opponents or have a, a position group fatal flaw. Like I think Illinois is pretty good. Their offensive line is not on par with what a top 15, top 12, top 20 team should probably be. So everybody's pretty flawed after those three teams. And we'll even see on Penn State, I think their defense is very good, but offensively they've been sort of uneven. You know, they couldn't separate from Bowling Green early on this season, couldn't separate from USC, which has struggled. So we'll see on Penn State, but they're undefeated. They're absolutely a top five team. I just think there's a fall off and clear flaws after those first three. You look at Oregon's path the rest of the way, and actually I'm going to pivot to Anthony because you took all the airspace last segment here, Aaron. But Anthony, <laughs> Oregon's path to remain number one. Everyone points to the fact that the last time they were ranked number one, they lose at home to Stanford immediately after that. But now you've got Illinois coming in. It's a top 20 matchup. Then you look at the rest of the schedule. That Michigan game isn't what many people thought it was going to be when the season started. What do you like about Oregon's chances to stay at this number one spot for a couple of weeks now? Jordan, you know I don't like rankings. They, they, they mean nothing. Uh, I'm, I'm an ex-player, as you know, and, an ex, and, and, and a coach right now. And it's all about what you do the next game. Right? And you, until the very end, until that championship game, you know, you're ranked number one. Okay, great. Uh, now everybody's looking to get you. And, and then as a coach, you got to defend yourself and go, okay, okay. You know, hey, we got to really practice harder. Everybody's coming after us. But I like what Kirby said, Kirby Smart said when he was with Georgia, when he's, he's still with Georgia, but he said with his team, uh, yeah, we're number one. And some reporter said, well, uh, how do you feel like, you, you know, you're being hunted now at, at being number one? He goes, we've never, we've never been hunted. We always do the hunting. So Oregon and Dan Lanning are doing the same thing. They're worried about themselves. They're not worried about anybody else. They're worried about themselves and they do the hunting. They're going after people. You know, they're not the bullseye. Number one ranking, it's great for fans, for media, but it's still football. It, it, the season's too early. Uh, now, do I, do I get push the back on that a little bit, Anthony, and I, and I hear you for sure as a former player. Aaron, number one means you're playing eight versus nine, if you can hold that number one till the end of the season. Number one might sit a little bit different with recruits. Do you think there's any credence to holding that number one spot for a couple of weeks? Well, yeah. I mean, that means you're not losing, which is always good. At the end of the day, with a playoff system, with a deep playoff field, the number one ranking is not going to mean much other than seeding, right? What's funny about this is that, you know, you look at the schedule and you're thinking, I don't see an obvious loss. However, the Ducks have only gone undefeated once ever. And that's because that's a difficult thing to do. And it's not like all seven wins have been dominant. They are literally four plays away from being five and two. And so then you have to wonder when they, if they get into a tough situation, especially on the road at Michigan or on the road at Wisconsin, could some things break against them to where you drop a game, which has happened in the past. Like in 2001, they beat Ohio State. A few weeks later, they lose at Stanford. We can go on and on and through the history of those things happening. So game for game, I'd pick Oregon in every game, but I kind of feel like there's a loss out there that may jump up and get them. So, Dan, you look at the rest of their schedule, and as far as holding number one, what do you think is the biggest test for Oregon for the rest of this regular season before the Big Ten championship game, potentially? I guess it's maybe Wisconsin, just because it's the middle of November. It'll be cold in Madison. You know, the question I have for the rest of their schedule is, you probably need to score 30 points to beat Oregon. And this is a Wisconsin team that I think just scored 23 against Northwestern in a nice dominant defensive win. But you need to get to that bar, it feels like. And when you have a Washington team who has struggled on offense at times, obviously Wisconsin, Michigan's had its own struggles. Wisconsin did nothing in that second half against USC, albeit on the road. It's, it's tough to see who exactly will do it. I think you need some pop to beat Oregon. And which of these teams has a defined ability to generate offensive pop? 
I don't see it at the moment. Uh, we'll see on Dylan Gabriel's health. I, I guess that could be the only thing that could uh, change the the calculus here. But yeah, it's really tough to find if they don't have receivers who are testing Oregon downfield, like Ohio State or whoever they might face in a potential playoff spot can. Uh, it's hard to see right now. And I, and I agree All 100%. Right, quick, wait, wait, hold on. But the problem is when Oregon has been upset, it's because they went against a team that sort of muddied the game and then they didn't need sure. the pop. Like Stanford did twice, actually three times actually, right? And so that's where you wonder, do, do they go into Wisconsin and all of a sudden – Dylan, those interceptions he threw that were inexplicable, he has two of right. those in that game, right? And then the other team starts running the ball really well. Next thing you know, it's 27-27 in the fourth quarter. You're like, oh, my God. And that's where I think they could get got is if they lower their level of play at the wrong moment. And even, But even with those two picks, 31 points, right? That you still need to score the 30, even with those mistakes. And I, I totally to agree it, with right? you. Somebody can muddy it up. I just look at the schedule and you're just like, I don't see a lot of mud. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, Dan. Real quick, before we let you go, your thoughts and predictions this matchup against Illinois. Yeah, I think Oregon's going to be able to take advantage, even with Jordan Birch out. And I, I think they're just going to win the line of scrimmage in a pretty aggressive way. I think you're going to see a lot of Jordan James, a lot of Noah Whittington, and then some play action over the top. We saw Illinois really struggle on the road. I think they scored seven at Penn State. I think it's going to be similar. I think Oregon scores more. I'd be surprised if Illinois got to 17 in this game so i have it at like 42 to 13 all right my man well thanks again for joining us thanks for uh pushing back a little bit on fentures as well too we always have time to keep them in line <laughs> anthony can't be the only one that has to do that so <laughs> thanks again man and uh, make sure you continue to check out dan at the solid verbal podcast.com all right stick around when we come back we'll give you more of our thoughts this matchup against illinois as oregon gets set for a top 20 matchup at home What's the, been the difference from a five and seven Illinois team last year to, to one that's in the top twenty? Well, I mean, they're they're doing an unbelievable job attacking, you know, attacking the ball and protecting the ball. I think their quarterback's thrown one interception this season. You know, I think they've had, you know, eight picks on, on defense and caused ten fumbles on, on defense. So they're a team that swarms. Uh, when you can win the turnover map, uh, margin, you're gonna have a lot of success. You know, they've outrushed several of their opponents when you can, you know, win the physical uh, battle up front as far as being able to move the ball. Uh, they're really sound in special teams, do a really good job in special teams, have dynamic returners. So I think all those things, they're, they're playing really complimentary football. And uh, their quarterback's athletic. Um, they have two, they have good wideouts, you know, that, that do a really good job. So they, they are a balanced team. And when you have good balance, it's hard to take away a team's strengths. Well, welcome back. That was Dan Lanning, his Monday presser as the team gets set to take on Illinois. And it's fascinating, you guys, because you get the schedule well in advance and you look at this matchup against Illinois and you're thinking, okay, Oregon just taking on one of those Big Ten opponents. It's not Wisconsin. It's not Michigan. It's not Ohio State. This is now a top 20 matchup featuring the number one team in the nation, Oregon, and Illinois that's been one of the more pleasant surprises in the college football world this year. And so, Anthony, they're coming into town. This is an Illinois team that has shown a lot of really good balance on both sides of the ball. They've got a couple holes here and there, but... What do you make about Illinois, and what does Oregon have to keep in mind in this matchup? Illinois is a good football team. Uh, you know they're going to run the football. They're, you know, hard nosed football team. They play tough defense. Their offense is not great. I think they're ranked ninety second in the country in total offense, and, and their defense is ranked fiftieth. Uh, so they're a solid football team. You can't sleep on them. And I, I, I want to tip my hat off to Dan Lanning. He's done a great job with this Oregon program. Uh, the kids trust him. Uh, the kids want to perform for him. You know, they believe in him. And that's huge. I mean, you know, when you have a coach and you go, hey, I'll, I'll jump through a wall for you. You'll, I'll do anything. I'll work harder for you. Uh, then you have the kids where you want them. And so Dan has done a good job of getting his team ready to play uh, against Purdue on a short week uh, after a huge win. And now you have Illinois, you know, and, and they're coming. They're flying from Illinois all the way out here. <laughs> that's a long flight, the travel situation. Uh, but Dan will have his kids ready. Aaron, Illinois, they come in. They've shown some running prowess, some issues with the offensive line, though. This feels like a game where Oregon at home should dominate for the most part. But do you see any potential challenge or where they might have a hiccup against this Illinois team? Well, my birth certificate says Illinois on it. You can see I got my Bears Walter Payton signed helmet right here. So I'm taking the line line. All day long, they're about to come in and no, I'm just kidding. Okay, listen, back to reality here. That's what that's what a homer looks like. Okay, so being objective, 
to me, this is a trap game, right? That, that Purdue nonsense is manufactured. This is a trap game because this is a team that has won some impressive games. You know, Nebraska, Michigan, Michigan's offense is down, I know, but still, they beat them 21-7, right? This is a team that can put up some points. This is a team that has a solid quarterback, a decent run game. The defense has been a little bit up and down, especially that Purdue game. But this is the trap game because this is a team that can come into Austin and take advantage if you play subpar football. And that's where upsets happen, right? We, we talked about 2012 when Oregon stumbled against Stanford. Oregon played subpar Oregon football. That's why they lost. You go through all the big upsets, it's Oregon playing subpar football. So if Oregon plays subpar this week, they could lose because this team is poised to take advantage of something like that. Do I think that's going to happen? Heck no, but this is the type of matchup where it could. And it's interesting because, you know, Illinois just took care of business against Michigan. They've also won at Nebraska. So you talk about the shell shock of coming to an Autzen Stadium. Very few stadiums kind of on par with Autzen Stadium. At Nebraska, you can make that argument, is one. So Illinois, they're going to be battle-tested coming into this game in Eugene. We'll see if Oregon can continue to pitch an A-type game. All right, when we come back, we're going to give you our predictions. Ducks are favored by more than three scores. We'll let you know what this one's going to shake down to when we come back on Talking Ducks. Welcome back. Time now for our Road to Victory brought to you by Guarantee Chevrolet. And Aaron, this matchup here, it is Aaron, uh, Oregon versus Illinois. I almost called Illinois Aaron because you're just such a homer for anything <laughs> coming from that great state of Illinois. But, you know, Oregon's favored by 21 and a half points in this game. And you said this is a true trap game. Anthony, you feel like Illinois is a team that can possibly run the ball on the Ducks if they can, but they struggle at the offensive line. And let's start with you, Anthony. Give me a score prediction, and what is the most important part of this game that Oregon's got to play well in? Well, I think Oregon will cover. Uh, they'll beat them by, by 21 or more. Uh, Illinois doesn't have an offense that can score enough points to win, and you're going against that Oregon defense. That's getting better. <laughs> okay, Aaron, they're getting better. Uh, yeah, they shut out Purdue, but Purdue put up 49 points uh, against Illinois the week before that. So, you know, what's going on there? Uh, Dylan Gabriel, the best quarterback in the country. You're not going to stop him. And you talk about some receivers that can run uh, with the running game. The running game is not great right now, but it's enough uh, to, to keep you honest as a defense. But Oregon just runs through Illinois. I think Illinois is good yeah. enough to make it semi-interesting early and then Oregon pulls away. So I've got it like 43-20 which is still a beat down, but it'll be a little bit more of a competitive challenge early on because I, I feel like Illinois is, is coached well enough and they've gone on the road and played in some tough environments and done well. But in the end, Oregon's superior and they win. I'm just trying to do the math on how they get to 43 points. And so that's... That's <laughs> easy. The ones you don't see every too often. I like 42, 45, 44, <laughs> and 43. N nice prime number right there. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I've got Oregon 42-17 in this one. I think the Ducks run away with it. Illinois is going to get a couple of scores. I don't think you're going to get back-to-back -back shutouts. But Oregon's just clicking right now. I know it seems very easy and basic to say, but they're the number one team in the nation for a reason. They've been tested. And I think because of those tests and the game film they've been able to watch and learn from, this is a team that Anthony is getting better. <laughs> hey, love it. That'll do it for this edition of Talking Ducks. Thanks again for joining us. We'll have you covered next week as Oregon continues to march along this Big Ten schedule. But your number one ranked Oregon Ducks taking on Illinois at home to try to maintain that top spot amongst the polls. From all of us here, thanks again. We'll catch you next week. <laughs>